With the coronavirus pandemic, it's too easy to dismiss the way we're all now forced to live as the new normal. The truth is, it's not normal, nothing like it. The disease itself, the social distancing, the massive job losses and the world's blown up economies are completely alien to us. Governments are throwing enormous amounts of money at the problem, but as Sarah Arbo reports, it's impossible to put a price on the human cost of this catastrophe. School day! Wake up, school day! It's early morning in the Woods household on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. School day! Mum Trish reckons it's a school day. But for her four children, stuck at home for weeks now, it's more like Groundhog Day. Oh my God, it's gone. You're gonna get up every well, at first it was like a holiday, um, like we are just on school holidays. And then, sort of probably the, by the third week, the start of the third week, it started to get a bit tense and um, like, are we coming out, like a bit more depressive, I think. Trisha's energy is infectious, and while there's no doubt all this activity is important for the kids, what is it? Cute. It's also a distraction Cute. from a desperate reality Trish doesn't want to think about. What are you up to? A few weeks ago, she and her partner Aaron both lost their jobs. Now they're not only broke, but also very close to breaking. How are you two going? Pretty good. Nothing, nothing. I've got 51 cents. You've got probably a couple of dollars. I think I've got $10 in one account, that's it. How much money did you have coming in? About two, two, two thousand. and a half thousand a week. Just, it fluctuate from here to there, but paid our rent, paid our bills. Mm -hmm. um, Enough to live comfortably. Yeah, yeah comfortably. Enough to buy the kids you know. stuff. It's not just about being penniless, yeah. it's the speed with which yeah, it true. happened that's really shocked this couple. So working 10, 12 hour days yeah. all week yeah. to nothing? To nothing, yeah. How quickly did that happen? Uh, Overnight. Yeah, pretty stressful. Um, and in the meantime, we're borrowing money off family um, so that you can just put food on the table. Across the country, the stories of economic heartbreak caused by the coronavirus are all too familiar. Hello, how, how are you? Going? Good, good. good. How, how was today? Yeah, not too bad. In Sydney, Janelle Joseph is doing something she never, ever imagined. I've added things on here for you. Oh, wow. Gratefully accepting food from charity to feed her family. Produce for you, lots of goodies, bread, veggies. A lot of people wouldn't have expected they'd need to rely on charity in their lives. Oh, certainly not, certainly not. You know, we live quite comfortably and we are sufficient. And all of a sudden that changed through no fault of our own. And that is most confusing. And uh, we're very grateful for all the people that are there to help us and to help us navigate our way forward. The way forward is thanks to the Lamandra Community Pantry in Sydney's southwest. And the visits are now twice a week. Because the coronavirus has not just left Janelle out of work, it's given her four extra mouths to feed. Relatives who couldn't get by on their own. I have myself and my husband. I have my 83-year-old father. I have my brother, I have my daughter and her husband and another daughter and her partner living with us from Vanuatu. So you've gone from having four people in your home to now eight under the one roof? That's right, that's correct. Lucky we have the space. Uh, but without the income, it's been uh, definitely a struggle, that's for sure. Did you feel a huge weight on your shoulders? 
We've actually gone from a family who didn't feel as though there were any uh, financial struggles or any financial difficulties. We've always been able to pay the bills on time and weekly. And now all of a sudden we had to sit down and have a think about where the grocery money was coming from, where the money for the registration of vehicles were coming from and which vehicles we would sell to be able to manage to get through all of this as well. Janelle is one of more than a million Australians either unemployed or underemployed because of the coronavirus, a number that's predicted to rise dramatically. As an employer of more than 100,000 Australians, Wes Farmer's boss Rob Scott knows the importance of keeping people in work. When you look around at all the people who have been impacted, are you concerned about those people perhaps not being able to recover, not being able to find jobs post-pandemic? Uh, absolutely. I'm very concerned about people losing their jobs and, and also people being stuck at home for so long. I think there's also a real cost of being out of work. Uh, it goes to self-esteem, it goes to mental health. And I think that really goes to a much more important role of employment which is not about the national economy, it's about our, our well-being and mental health. Welcome to my happy place. Oh, this is it, your beautiful studio. Yes, yes. Trish used to run a thriving and profitable dance studio. Five weeks ago, for the safety of her staff and students, she shut it down. Must be strange to get used to an empty studio like this. I don't want to get used to it. And hopefully it won't be too much longer and we can all be back together. Mm. So yeah, it's, it is very strange to be here and be so quiet. It's never quiet, yeah. ever. But in saying that, we all have to stay positive and I am that, positive. Trish is lucky, she's optimistic by nature. Lunch now. But her boilermaker partner, Aaron, unemployed for the first time in 30 years, isn't, Josh? and is finding it very hard going. What do the next few weeks look like for you? Pretty grim. When all this happened, when I ran out of work, didn't have any work, I seeked help. So I think there's a lot of people in the same boat. So I'm probably speaking for a lot of people. Like one and a half million other Australians, both Trish and Aaron applied for the $1,100 a fortnight job seeker payment. If I click on you claim. And after an agonising four weeks, they finally qualified and a few days ago received some welcome money. It's been a similar story for thousands of struggling businesses trying to retain staff by applying for the government's $1,500 fortnightly JobKeeper allowance. Wes Farmer's Rob Scott was one of four business leaders Treasurer Josh Frydenberg asked to help formulate the package. It is $130 billion over six months. This is not something the government can afford to do forever. And that is why it is so important that in a measured way, we, we, we plot a path to get people back in work, get businesses operating again, so the government doesn't need to bear this burden. When the sausage starts sizzling again outside Bunnings, I think we'll have thought we've returned to normal finally. <laughs> I think that's right. What we got today, oh, yeah. unbelievable. At Janelle's home, donated dinners have become the norm. But the upheaval of the past few weeks is still taking a lot of getting used to. Have you and anyone else in your household applied for any government subsidies? We had applied for job, uh, job seeker and all my children had applied for job seeker or job keeper, but none of us have received any of that as yet. Lift, no arms. Keeping busy is Trisha's way of coping. Her studio might be shut down, but everyone's still dancing. Not that it's helping financially. 
Good girls. So you're offering those classes for oh, free? Oh, yes, yeah. Those, the, the kids that are, are dancing that cannot afford to dance are still dancing now with me um, because I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't live myself. My heart breaks. Our best sort of chance of getting the economy back on track involves doing it slowly and very carefully, not, not, not rushing. As painful as life has become for thousands of families, Chris Edmund, Professor of Economics at the University of Melbourne, says we must endure more. He's warned the government that lifting the lockdown too soon could actually leave us worse off. What we want to avoid is kind of this sort of bang, bang, on, off, having to kind of crunch the sort of the shutdown and again and again because we keep letting it get out of control because we're do too impatient to get back to normal and end up in some sense taking longer to get back to normal because of that impatience. Will we ever return to a pre-pandemic normal? The size of the shock is so large that we're going to be struggling for it for, you know, for like two years to come before we're kind of really looking at, at something that could be considered back to normal on the economic front alone. But there is some positive news. Professor Edmund says Australia's economy is in a better state than almost every other country in the world. And the point is now that we're in that relatively fortuitous position to be really, really careful not to blow it. It's an unprecedented economic situation and the fiscal response is comparably unprecedented. Remarkably, on the Mornington Peninsula, Trish and Aaron also see some good in the bad. We're far more connected now than we ever used to be. You know, our heads were buried in our phones um, texting people all the time. I don't want to text people now. I want to actually speak to them, mm. you know, and not a bad thing. No. I, think we, I think we all needed, not saying that we needed this to happen, but in one way we needed to reconnect with who we are and reconnect with our families, reconnect with what's important to us mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as individuals. For all the misery coronavirus has brought, even for those who haven't caught it, it has taught us a valuable lesson about resilience, <laughs> that families like the Woods in Victoria and Joseph's in Sydney and millions of others across the country have loads of it. What do they call this stuff we're eating? It's called a quiche flan pie. Oh. And maybe the new normal we're all so worried about is really just a return to the good old days. In those days, everybody grew a choco vine over their toilet. And your father, Barry, now has a captive audience there too. Oh, he's got wonderful stories, wonderful, wonderful stories that have kept us all laughing. We had a choco vine and a passion fruit vine. We're in the toilet, we could put our hand out <laughs> Grab take a passion, a passion fruit, fruit. Oh, no. and uh, eat it. <laughs> On the toilet. <laughs> so that's a story. It's wonderful, yes. He's loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Good story, Grandpa. Good story. Good story, Grandpa. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.